Hi, my name's Vince from MyMateVince.com. A few people have been asking for that. Right, here we have something a little bit unusual on the channel. Now, most of you, 99.9% .9 of you, will not know what this is, but a few of you will know what it is if you used to work for BT back in the 1990s and early 2000s. If you were a field engineer, like I used to be, this here saved you so much time and customers used to think you were some sort of wizard because you could pinpoint a fault. We used to call this a mole. The actual proper name for it is a Tester 301C. I bought this 40 off eBay, but this is now obsolete. As of the mid 2000s, BT then introduced something called a Hawk Tester, which was kind of like a multimeter and this built into uh, one piece of kit. So, sold as 40, let me tell you what this thing should do. Let's say now, if you don't know, a telephone line works on two wires, right the way from your master socket going all the way back to the telephone exchange, whether that be 500 meters, 1,000 meters, or 8,000 meters. It's just two wires going from point A to point B. Obviously now, in the future, it's changing, going over to a VoIP network. But at this moment in time, there's still millions of customers on a two-wire network from the house going right the way back to the telephone exchange. So when it leaves the exchange, it might be on a thousand pair cable, and then it might go down to 100 pair cables. Then it will go down to 50 pair, 20 pair, up to the top of the pole. It might even go down to a two pair cable feeding underground into your property. So every time one cable, a bigger cable meets a smaller cable, they're jointed and you join them together with jelly crimps, which are basically just a nice easy way of crimping two wires together. Now, on any one of those crimps, you could have a fault. It could become disconnected. Sometimes the wires just break. Normally it's if engineers are in there trying to fix somebody else's line. They might accidentally knock off another line. It is possible that the cable could go faulty in the actual mid length of the cable. Maybe if some roots or something has damaged the ducting and then the cable's been against the roots, the roots are growing, it's possible then that it could break mid span. But this thing here will tell you where the break in the wire is and it's amazing it works for thousands of meters if i can get it working hopefully i can show you this at the end why is this good well what you would do is you would put this on at the customer's property to begin with or the green box you know the the green cabinets in the street and then what you would do is you would disconnect the line and then you would test for example from the customers going back or from the uh, uh, green box going forward and then you will see where the break in the wire is so let's say now at the customer's property if you put this on the wires so you put this in here and then you go on to the two wires if you see a thing going up, I think it was from it. There you go, a disconnect fault going up and a short circuit fault going down. So if you see it going up here, maybe 40 meters away, chances are that might be the top of the pole. If it's 80 meters away, what you would do is you would start going outside the property and you would count the meters. So you know that the down lead might be, for example, five meters or something, and then it's, you pace it across to the pole. So you walk each step normally is a meter and you would step it and then coming down the pole, you might be measuring another eight meters or nine meters and then you would just keep counting until you get to your 80 meters 180 meters whatever it is and then it's that accurate that hopefully then that area will get you to a manhole because normally you don't have manholes every two meters you know what i mean you might have manholes every kind of 30 meters or something like that depending obviously on the road it might be underground fed and then you're going to have manholes a lot more often but this thing saves so much time because the only other way of doing it would be to physically break it down at different points so test that the customer go to the green box is it working there yes the fault's between the green box and the customer go midway again which way is the fault coming from back to the green box or to the customer. With this, you don't need to do any of that. It will show you where the fault is. It is amazing. You would use this on near enough every single job. Really, really useful thing. Anyway, that is the background of this. Hopefully, you will find this as interesting as me. Now you know the background of it. So when I used to work for BT, I used to use something like this all the time. Every day, you would be using this. Now, 
Is it coming on? Yes, it is. Excellent. Right, can you see all the lines on the screen there? But beyond those lines, I can just about make out. You have to bear with me because it has been years. Uh, I don't know when I would have used one of these last, probably 17 years ago. But I can make out lines there. And then you have to up the gain for longer distances, I think it was. Then you used to move along like this. Is the light working? Right, okay. Well, anyway, you can see it's not making any sense there because there's lines everywhere. So let's take it apart and see if we can get this, uh, see if we can get it working again. And there's not going to be, I haven't looked, but there's not going to be videos. This is too specialised for any videos to exist on YouTube about it. And when it comes to BT, I don't even know what would have happened to old faulty equipment. I'm not sure whether it would have gone off for repair. Things like this just really, the one I had, I had for my whole time when I was there. It never until I had to hand it in when we got the BT, the Hawk, the new version. So uh, yeah, my one never went faulty. Right, I can see big screws around the edge here. Let's undo them and hopefully then it will start coming apart. Right, while I'm uh, taking the back off this, let's shout out the my mate Vince Massive. This month they are kitdigital.com, Kip Hakes, Max Rokotansky, Having Fun Repairs, Ellensburg Amplifier Repair and Service, Will Michaelis, Chris Seal, Felipe at MrKeeps.com, King Curd from Low Book Auto Sales, DJVG, Stuart Park, Ellis Garbert, Pigsy, The My Mate Vince Fan Club, Braden Butt from Connecticut, and Kenneth Blenstrup Sorensen. Right, oh my words, there's a jelly crimp in here. This has already had a repair. There's a jelly crimp. And let's see, let's have a let's have a look at that. We might be able to tell the age from the jelly crimp. Right. Let's zoom in on that jelly crimp and see if it's a deck screen one. It's a deck screen one. There we go. So I think that's had a repair within I would say the last uh, last ten years. Because BT used to use Channel and uh, Tyco and various crimps throughout the years. These are the jelly crimps that I was talking about. You know, for example, when one cable meets another cable, they're crimped together. Well, years ago, they would have been like twisted, like when they were paper joints and stuff, the lead and paper joints. But obviously, when we've gone over to plastic, uh, then uh, it's just much quicker to do these ones here. Right, okay. So now, I didn't take much notice there. Were they just like that? Oh, one side, yeah, so one side and the other side, yeah, okay. It just goes in like that. So what is it, two banks? How have they done this? Is it two banks of, uh... yeah, it must be two banks of six volts or something going into it, rather than 12 volts. Okay. Anyway, I don't think we have to worry about that. So, now... One of the posts is broken here, no problem. What have we got going on? Never seen the inside of one of these. Quite nicely made, isn't it? We've got two ribbon cables, so I'm assuming that one of them is going to be for the screen. So let's undo this and see what's happening. Let's uh, just take this off. There, that can't go on the wrong way. Can this go on the wrong way? No. Nope. Can't go the wrong way either because there's a clip here. Right. Very clean on the inside. Oh, little bit of corrosion here. I was about to say very clean, but there is a little bit of corrosion just here. Let's just deal with that now. I don't think that's going to be causing it, but let's just get some IPA on that. Now, I don't think that is flux from the factory because it seems to only be on that part. Now isopropyl alcohol I can use on here without worrying about damaging anything. Looks a bit corroded here as well. Just a bit dull, these solder joints. Around there.
Yeah, definitely corroded because you can see the gold traces now don't really look good, do they? Maybe it's not a screen issue. Let's just get our multimeter and make sure that is still making a contact. Yeah, it is, yeah. Where does it go to after that? Down into probably this chip here. So, from here. Over this side. Yeah, I think that's all okay. Uh, I'm not going to bother trying it again now because I don't think that's made any difference. That looks a bit iffy there as well, doesn't it? It's okay though. Right, let's get to the screen. So I suppose the item's at an age now where you are going to get faults with the, uh, the screen connector or maybe if it's got those zebra connectors, maybe they've gone a little bit weak, not as spongy as they were before. Okay, let's see what we got. Another board. Ah, right, another board. It's interesting. A ribbon cable go into that one there. So now this is the screen up here, isn't it? And yes, so I need to get to this board. The screen looks like it's just held in with these metal, those little metal tabs. Can we undo this without breaking it? Right, that's soldered on. Can we undo it from here? Yes. Right, so again, it could be the screen or it could be something to do with the contacts that go from here to the screen. I think it's more likely to be the screen though. That all looks good on that side. Okay. Oh, this here is just for the pressure pads at the front. Ribbon cable there. Looks like there's room for a VGA connection. Yeah, so that maybe they were gonna do something along the lines of plugging in something via VGA. What's happening here? Hmm, it's slightly more complicated than I thought. Right, so there's nothing on that bit there. Yeah, this is really well made. This is like a metal surround. I can see two wires there. I'm presuming that's the backlight. So I am going to have to... Ah, here we go. Zebra connectors. Look, can you see zebra connector here and here? Top and bottom. Like you can't see them that side. So maybe what I'm thinking is zebra connectors might have been misshapen or uh, maybe there's not enough pressure down on them. So let's take them off. Maybe they need a clean, maybe corrosion or something's got in there. All looks very good though. Maybe when I do this, it might never go back together perfectly now. Let me just get some pliers. Yes, it is. Okay. Now, ah, so we've got a ribbon. Oh, annoying. We've got a ribbon cable as well. Ah, uh, but it's gone here. The lines were horizontal, weren't they? It's going to be here that they're gone. That's annoying. 
So you've got a ribbon, you've got a zebra connector for the top and bottom, and yet we've got, there, there's, they're everywhere. Right, you can see all the contacts, look, from here to here, and from here to here. I think it's this that's gone, because these are just glued on. That's annoying. Right, okay, let's, uh, is that going to come off? Or should I use IPA? Let's see. Is it coming? Yeah, that's breaking the seal there. Let's try at the top. Let's see what we got. Okay, so here are the zebra connectors. They're the contacts there. They look pretty good, but I might give them a clean. And then we have two wires going off. This is going to be the backlight in here. So there's probably going to be a. Here we go. These are all. Are these all the LEDs? Would they be the LEDs down here shining inwards? Maybe, I think so. So, I would say, is this gonna come off? We'll give it a clean. So if you zoom in on these, you'll see it's like uh, uh, all going through that way. Can you see them all? So you might well find that each pad might go across two or three of these little connections. So if you have a look at the pad down here, can you see where we've gone? Yeah, there might be like two or three contact, maybe just two on each of them. Right, I'm going to clean that and that, and also the, uh, the bottom zebra connector, but I think it's going to be to do with this here, which is going to be glued on, which is annoying. Which side is it going to be? Is it going to be where it's glued onto here or here? Let's do the cleaning first of all, just in case it is related to here. So again, IPA, and I'm just going to use a little cotton bud, a Q-tip, and some isopropyl alcohol. No, I think that's it for cleaning. You can see that it's perfectly clean here. So I don't think that's an issue at all. Let me just go across here. I'm just gonna let them dry. Now, what have we got going on here? So it's on this side here and this side here. So this is going to be a little bit awkward, really. Uh, how can I, can I turn this on? No, I can't turn this on because I need the pressure down on the zebra connectors. Because everything was perfect on the zebra connectors and these contacts here, I don't believe it's anything to do with them. It would be sensible to put it back together just to double check that but I can't see how they were causing the problem because everything just looks perfect. I think it's gonna be where it's glued on here because the glue is just gonna be losing its uh, stickiness over all these years. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna get my soldering iron on at about maybe 200, might try about 230 degrees Celsius, and I'm gonna rub across here and here a few times. Hopefully that will redo the seal. Right, tip's nice and clean.
So you can see the contacts here in gold and they're attaching to the black contacts on the ribbon cable. So the adhesive must be these uh, white bits in between. Right, well that's it done there, but I probably will need to go back on it again. Let's just see if I can do it onto the actual glass. Just want to make sure that the ribbon cable is on top. Yeah. Right, I think that will do for just the initial one and we can see what's happened now, whether we've got any lines back at all. And maybe if we were to have some lines back, then I know I can go over it more at a higher temperature. So I suppose this works something along the lines of, it knows that copper cables, telephone cables are 0.5 uh, millimeters in diameter. Yes, there's still some aluminium in the network, so that's probably gonna change the resistance a bit, but it's mostly copper. And uh, it knows then the resistance when it sends a signal down, how long it takes to get the signal back. So obviously if there's a break 50 meters away, it can calculate that. If there's a break 100 meters away or 500 meters away, it can calculate that. So I presume it's just doing it via resistance. But you can put it down in the comments anyway if you know how it works. And um, again, with the short circuit as well, it must be doing the same thing where it's going and coming back and then it can work out the distance. So with this, I'm just putting the left hand side to the left hand side and the right wire to the right hand side. Okay, hey, now, is it going to work? Yes, beautiful. Okay, there's, uh, hmm, there's still some pixels missing. Do I take it further? Because the thing is, you can read this now. Let me just see if that light's coming on as well. No, I can't really, I presume the light just lights. Do you know, yeah, I think the light used to make it light up blue or something. Right, so the light's not working. So you can see where it says one there and 88 meters there, there's a little line going through it. So that says to me, that's gonna be on the, that's gonna be on those uh, zebra connectors, but we've still got missing pixels but not many now. You can see they're up this edge, so at least I know where to concentrate on. I'm gonna take a picture of that, and then I'll know where to, uh, where to concentrate. Yeah, well, it's much better than it was, but it's still not perfect, and the light's not doing anything. Now, I don't know whether that's the button or whether it's the actual light itself. So let's take it apart again and this time let's rub the soldering iron across the top of the ribbon cable where the lines are missing. I've got the photo for reference. And also let's measure voltage when we press the light button on that black and red wire and see whether we've got voltage there. If we have, it suggests that it's the LEDs that are faulty. If we haven't, then it would suggest that there's something on the board that isn't generating that voltage. 
Right, let's see now. It's all balanced a bit iffy, but uh, let's see. Turn it on. Okay. Right, so that's there now. Now let's hit the light. Definitely seen a flash up here. So, if the light should be on now, let's see if we got anything. I'll go to DC to begin with. Oh, look at that. I've just noticed there's like a green light flashing there. It's making a noise as well. I can hear that. Yeah, okay. Hold on, one second. Let me uh, get distracted. Let's go to AC. There's nothing there. Nothing there. Let's hit the light now. Ah, 4.9 volts. We have got it there. Right, so it's not a button thing. So if you watch that now, 4.9, I'm going to hit it. Hopefully that will go to zero. I need another person to do this. Hold on, there we go. And now hit it again. Right, so annoyingly, it's not the circuit. It's something to do with the LEDs themselves. Hit it again. Okay, brilliant. Well, we've proved that now. That's good. Let's turn this off. There we go. Right, let's disconnect this before we cause any damage. So there's a problem on the LEDs. I don't think that's going to be repairable, but let's have a little look. Again, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's still it's still going to be more than usable. It's just that it would be nice to get it fully working. So in this bit here, I'm just dismantling the screen to get to the LEDs. Now in my head, I'm sort of thinking it might be similar to a little handheld games console where you have a row of LEDs. You can physically see little square LEDs on there. But this is different. There is a row at the top and the bottom. And when you look at the little circuit board on the back, each of them have a square pad and a circle pad. But the actual LEDs are kind of encased into the plastic they're kind of like there's all plastic melted around it so i think it's all made as a whole unit i don't think the leds are kind of just uh, put on there afterwards i think it's made with the plastic back plate and then you put the diffuser and stuff on there when i look through my microscope at the leds they're not like what you would expect that you would see nowadays like a little kind of yellow one and one that's all encased it's a little square with a little dot on it and there's a tiny little wire coming out of that to go to for example the positive or the negative so it's kind of like the raw component that's just been all molded into the actual uh, diffuse backplate backlight itself it's kind of strange but what it does mean is that it can't be repaired so what i'm having to do is i'm getting some 240 volt led light uh, bulbs and I'm taking the LEDs out of them because on the uh, on the lights they'd all be done in series I'm just doing a complete bodge job here I'm just getting a few of them wiring them up in parallel just so I've got some sort of light but it's not going to look good because it's not going to be diffused over the whole screen it's just kind of going to be kind of lighting up in the middle bit but because I'm keeping the diffuser at the back I'm hoping the light will still travel through the main objective is to have it functioning to allow some sort of light in dark conditions so all of this bit here probably does take me about an hour in total with all the soldering because it's all absolutely tiny but i'm just going to show you uh, them after i've done that little bit then right soldering up these is incredibly hard because not only is it tiny but the soldering iron just melts all the plastic but anyway look i've just done this one and this one here so if i get my bench power supply and go between there and there you will see that they'll light up. I don't want to do it too long because obviously I'm not sure about the current it can take. And this one here. There. So now what I'm going to do is I am just going to get some hot glue. And I'm going to put that into the middle there. And I'm going to put this one into the middle here. Then I'm going to connect up the black wires together here and here. And I'm going to connect up the red wires together. Sorry, I've got off camera. Uh, so the black wires together 
here and here, and then the red wires together here and here. And then, hopefully, when it's encased in the kind of glue, it will uh, it will be okay, I'm hoping. That's the plan, anyway. Oh my my, that was a bit of a nightmare. Anyway, you can see the mess of captain tape. I've just tried to tape everything down. I reused the original wires that were going across there, and I've just run the enameled wire from here going over there. So the negatives are connected together, the positives are connected together, and they're going over here. Uh, I've put captain tape everywhere, had a little bit of a burn up here. It wasn't easy, it's incredibly small and delicate. But anyway, if you have a look now, if I put the negative on there and just tap that there, you can now see that we have some form of backlight. I'm sure it's gonna look awful, but let's uh, let's give it a go. Anyway, that's that bit. I'm not gonna mess with that anymore. Let's see if we can redo these bits here. So I'm just gonna be doing the same as I did before. 230 degrees and just going up and down where it was missing. So I'm gonna get my phone now, the picture, and just do it corresponding to that. So it was mostly up the top, wasn't it? Yeah, really it's fine from here to here. Just one line here and then a cluster up the top. So I do the exact same trick as before with the soldering iron, apart from I concentrate my efforts at the top where the lines are still missing. Right, I'm gonna put it back together now and we'll see if it's gonna work. Right, I'll put the rest of the screws in later. Let's see, do I think it's gonna work? No, I think it's gonna be worse than it was before because I think maybe the LEDs are pushing out the Zebra connectors. Let's see. Here it goes. Ready? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That's perfect. That is perfect. Now, light. There we go, we got something. Let's uh, turn the lights off. Well, I wasn't expecting that to work. Let's see if it will do it now. Yes, it will. Okay, it's not that very diffused, but you can see. You can see it. Contrast. Ah, so what's that, we got one missing. We've got one missing here and one missing here, that's fine. Look at that, it's almost perfect. So out of everything, just one on one. I'm not taking it apart again because of that. Look at that, excellent. So you can't see anything there now. Fantastic. Right, okay, uh, I'm gonna put it back together properly. You can actually see, you know that red flashing, that green flashing light that was doing it earlier? You can see that when it's in complete darkness. Oh, I'm well happy with that. Right, let me uh, put it back together properly, then I'll give it a clean, just to get rid of all this grime, and then we can uh, I can show you it working, showing a short and a disconnect. Okay, so we're done. It's cleaner than it was. It's still not perfect. It doesn't need to be perfect, because it's a tool. 
Right, so here we have two drums of cable. So this is going to simulate the wires in the ground. Now earlier on I was talking about faults, but of course this is used for installs as well. If a customer wants a second, third, fourth, fifth line, then again you need to measure how far the wires are going because then you can pace it out and then you can connect it onto another pair of wires going back towards a telephone exchange. So what we do is we turn it on here and at the moment it's just uh, by default the line here is 88 meters you'll see how it's going to work now in a minute when i zoom in so this drum is a part drum of 100 meters that's a part drum of 200 meters they're almost full so if we were to get this one let's get this one here and let's go on to the blue wires so this is the first pair of this cable nice strong crocodile clips on here and because it's going to be a disconnect, because the other side of this cable isn't doing anything, you see now we have a disconnect fault. Well, it's not a fault, it's just, you know, measuring wires. So if you have a look, can you see that? Is that coming across? So what we would do now is we would now move the arrows until the line gets to the peak. So we can jump by, what's that, going up in 40 meters. So we know now that it is around 160 meters, but let's go in further for a more accurate measurement so by hitting full expand you can see we're toggling between the two and now we can just go per meter until we get to the beginning of that now this might not be absolutely perfect because it's on a roll of cable i don't know whether that's going to affect anything or not but look at that 178 meters and i would say that's pretty much spot on because a full drum is 200 meters and you can see that that is a part used drum so now let's see if this is going to work 178 so call it 180 times two is going to be 360 take away four 354 if i was to connect up these wires here then it should then go back down the orange pair the other way doubling up so let's put the blue to the orange and now let's see if we're going to get the uh 354 thereabouts Right, okay, that's not perfect, but right now, I think I hit the contrast. Right, here we go. So let's uh, go along. Now, you can still see the first peak at 168. That's really useful because sometimes when you're working on telecoms, there can be a high resistance fault. So what you're looking for sometimes is a little peak like that. And you can see here, we've just joined it up here. It's probably not making the best contact and it's displaying it here. So that's a really useful thing to do. Okay, so now we're moving along. Let's zoom in. And the start of the peak is there, 361. So you can see, well, maybe, to be fair, maybe it's more about there. 358, so you can see it's pretty accurate, isn't it? Because we've gone back on itself. Now, let's come out of here. And if we were to short the wires together, well, let's go on to this one here, because it's the shorter one here, just to show you a short circuit fault. So if we were to go on, let's just go on the orange this time, it makes no difference. Now, the weird thing, if you were to use this on something like Cat 5E or Cat 6 cable, it won't give you as an accurate a reading because this is a CW1308 from memory. And it's only got so many twists per meter. I don't know how many twists there are per meter, but let's just say maybe 20 twists or something. But when you think about Cat 5E, Cat 6 cable, it's twisted much more tightly. So you're using much more wire because each twist is taken up more room than if just the wires were side by side. So for example, to you know to make up this cable here, to make up 100 meters, you might need, I'm making this up, I don't know, 110 meters of actual wire, the cores on the inside. But when it comes to Cat 5E and Cat 6, you're gonna need much more, aren't you? Because the twists are so much tighter, you're gonna need much more wire to go the distance. So, uh, right, okay, if you have a look here now, so go back down here. And you can see there, 80 meters. So that looks to be about right. And if we were to touch the wires together, we should see that it won't go to a peak, it will go to a, uh, a trough. There you go, so you can see now it's gone downwards like so. And then we can adjust the gain. You see, we can make the gain 
uh, sort of more extreme. So if you're if you're looking for a fault and it might be like two or three thousand meters away, then you might have to up the gain in order to see because there's going to be quite a lot of noise on it. And by upping the gain, you'll see more of a peak. So it's really good, isn't it? And look at my light. <laughs> Now, hopefully, more of you will understand what one of these testers does. And as you can see from the inside, a very nicely made piece of equipment. You can tell that they would have been very expensive back in the day. And also, bright yellow like this. Hopefully, some of you also remember when BT vans used to be yellow before they went to grey, before they went to white open reach. So, uh, yeah, that is it. If you enjoyed this video, give it a massive thumbs up. And hopefully, I will see you all very, very soon. Take care. Floor looking